Kia ora and welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us today as we talk about the next generation of technology, 5G. We are here today to share information with you with transparency, honesty and integrity. I believe we need to be proactive. Every bone in my body feels the importance and urgency of stopping the rollout of 5G for reasons that we will share with you here today. So, let's talk about what this next generation of technology entails. What is 5G? 5G refers to the fifth generation wireless technology. Its intended purpose is to provide faster and higher capacity transmissions to carry the massive amount of data that will be generated from the future Internet of Things, such as smart cities, driverless cars, video streaming, augmented reality, and more. 5G will include the higher millimetre wave frequencies never before used for internet and telecommunications technology. So why are we concerned? Because what has not been made clear to us, the public, is that 5G won't just be another number and letter on our cell phones. It requires an entirely new infrastructure of small cellular antennas erected throughout every town as well as additional cell towers to what we already have now. 5G cell tower antennas will be supplemented by satellites. Up to 20,000 new satellites are scheduled to be launched into orbit to ensure that every inch of the planet is sufficiently irradiated to support high-speed wireless capability everywhere. Spark have already started erecting more towers in preparation for the act of five, activation of 5G in New Zealand. Initially, these will be used as 4G towers until a spectrum has been auctioned off by our government early next year. It has been confirmed that Spark are currently seeking out a site to lease and mummify to erect a monstrous 20 metre high cell phone tower that will indeed be 5G capable. They tried to lease space at the club's car park beside the golf course and across the road from the residential area. Thankfully, our Kuiper District Council owned the land there and they said no. These towers can be situated without the requirement of public or council consent or notification. All they need is permission from, land, from the landowner of whom in return gets paid a commercial rate for having it there. Every new cell tower erected is 5G capable. In their haste to implement 5G, national governments worldwide are taking steps to ensure a barrier-free regulatory environment. They are prohibiting local authorities, i.e. our council, from enforcing environmental laws and, in the interest of speedy and cost-effective deployment, removing unnecessary burdens such as our local planning procedures. All cell towers emit radio frequency, RF, radiation. However, 5G cell towers are more dangerous than other cell towers for two main reasons. First, compared to 3G and 4G, 5G is ultra high frequency and ultra high intensity. Second, since the shorter length millimetre waves used in 5G do not travel as far, with our current number of cell towers, the cell signal will not be reliable. To compensate, many more cellular antennas, as I previously mentioned, must be installed. To date, most wireless facilities have been located on private property at some distance from homes and businesses. In order for them to be spaced less than 100 metres apart, as required by 5G, however, they will now be located on the sidewalk on utility poles, directly in front of homes, businesses, schools, kindergartens, and close above the heads of pedestrians. With RF radiation, how close the source is to our physical bodies is more important than the power level of the radiation. RF radiation dissipates with distance. In other words, a low-powered exposure right next to someone is more dangerous than a more powerful exposure a long way away. Also, the longer the exposure time is, the more dangerous it is. 5G will be the worst of both worlds. 
We will have more sources around us and closer to us. They will be more powerful and continuous emissions. If 5G plans are implemented, there will be no escaping this EMR, EMF RF radiation that will blank us globally 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. So, how much money have the telecommunications companies invested in funding research on any possible health effects? Zero. In a US Senate hearing in February this year, the wireless industry was forced to admit that they have no safety studies on 5G wireless and don't intend to do any. Meanwhile, numerous recent scientific publications have shown that EMF electromagnetic field affects living organisms at levels well below most international and national guidelines. Effects include increased cancer risk, cellular stress, increase in harmful free radicals, genetic damages, structural and functional changes of the reproductive system, learning and memory deficits, neurological disorders, and negative impacts on general well-being in humans. Anthony Miller, an advisor to the World Health Organization, <coughs> said there's now enough evidence if they were to re-evaluate radio frequency radiation, it would be labeled as a probable carcinogenic to humans. It's very important for you to know that the safety guidelines that the telecommunication companies and our government refer to when they tell us that 5G meets the current standards were made in 1998 and are 20 years out of date. The scientific research completed in the last 20 years supports the notion that the safety standards urgently need reassessment to create new standards that protect us. The current international guidelines for EMF are based on the obsolete hypothesis that the critical effect of RF EMF exposure relevant to human health and safety is heating of exposed tissue. However, scientists have proven that many different kinds of illnesses and harms are caused without heating, i.e. non-thermal effect, at radiation levels well below the current guidelines. Yes, that does indeed mean that the standards are already failing to protect us from our current Wi-Fi technology which is well below the proposed levels of 5G. Regulators have deliberately excluded the scientific evidence of, of harm. Stakeholders thus far in the development of 5G have been industry and governments, while renowned international EMF scientists who have documented biological effects on humans, animals, insects and plants, and have alarming effects on health and environment in thousands of peer-reviewed studies have been excluded. The EMF guidelines were developed for short-term exposure. The current guidelines do not cover long-term exposure and low-intensity effects, which do indeed pose a dangerous risk to our health and well-being. The current standards are insufficient to protect public health and we need them to be reassessed urgently. The damage goes well beyond the human race, as there is growing evidence of harmful effects to both plant and animal life. This includes detrimental effects on our birds, bees and other pollinators. Studies have shown that EMF interferes with both bees and birds' navigation systems and reduces their reproduction rates. 5G technology is un uncharted territory. We do not know the full impact of the long-term exposure at constant and higher frequencies that this new technology is going to have on a global scale. But we should find out before it is imposed on us and our future generations. We have a right to know this information. 5G isn't being rolled out to serve us. It is not being rolled out because they feel we need to download movies faster. This new technology will be a multi-billion dollar industry. And we are not the only ones worried about the effects of 5G. There are massive positive steps happening all over the world, people joining forces, and this is what is needed. It is not hopeless. In fact, 
there is so much hope. Globally, people just like us are standing up and saying no to 5G. It's both exciting and encouraging to see their accomplishments. The growing awareness of the health impact of the 4G, 5G densification is resulting in action by policymakers worldwide. Cities are issuing resolutions and calls for research before deployment. There are citizen organisations in almost every country working on this and a growing list of public officials speaking out. Mark Steele, an expert and engineer on EMF technology, is a courageous campaigner against 5G and has been highlighting the dangers of a secret 5G rollout by a council in the UK where residents are complaining of increased illness and cancer in the affected area. After a city council attempted a silencing campaign, a UK judge has declared that the people have a right to know about the harmful effects of the 5G millimetre wave technology being deployed upon them. The judge declared Mark Steele as a credible expert and engineer on EMF and GSM technologies. Frank Clegg, ex-CEO of Microsoft Canada, was recently speaking on an EMF health summit. He was not only campaigning for safe technology, he was telling the truth about what the industry is doing to cover up cancer, DNA damage and infertility. And it's a relief to know that there are legal options for fighting back against 5G. Ray Broomhall, a barrister in Australia, has stopped numerous 5G installations in Australia and there are interviews available online where he discusses exactly how to do it. There's both scientists and medical professionals speaking out about the effects of Wi-Fi radiation. Australian brain surgeon Dr Charlie Teo has been sharing essential information on the health risks of EMF RF radiation and has been calling for a national right to know law about cell phone radiation as he has seen the detrimental effects of this radiation as a neurosurgeon. Also a wealth of knowledge, Dr Deborah Davis founded non-profit Environmental Health Trust in America in 2007 to provide basic research and education about environmental health hazards. You will find this website referenced at the bottom of the information flyer. Dr. Deborah Davis has a credentials list a mile long, including serving as President Clinton appointee to the Chemical Safety and Hazard Investigation Board in the USA. She has authored more than 200 publications and has been published in the New York Times. She is doing a phenomenal job of spreading awareness around the EMF, RF health risks, and how to minimize exposure. Her live talks can be found online and are well worth watching. Professor Martin Paul, PhD, molecular bioscientist, made a statement during one of his speeches that really sums it up. Putting tens of millions of 5G antennae without a single biological test of safety has to be about the stupidest idea anyone has had in the history of the world. These are just a few examples of the many people globally who are making a difference by creating awareness about the health implications of this technology. I'm so grateful to these courageous people for stepping up and speaking out about the untold truths that the telecommunications industry do not want us to know. Ask yourself this. Why have Brussels, the capital in Belgium, halted the rollout of 5G? Their environmental minister stated, I cannot welcome such technology if the radiation standards which must protect the citizen are not respected, 5G or not. The people of Brussels are not guinea pigs whose health I can sell at a profit. We cannot leave anything to doubt. Does this cautionary action ring alarm bells? Insurance companies are refusing to insure telecommunications companies against any health claims made against this technology. Why? Does this ring alarm bells? We have to wonder, why have thousands of peer-reviewed studies, including the recently published US Toxicology Program, 
a 16-year, $30 million study showing a wide range of statistically significant DNA damage, brain and heart tumours, infertility and so many other ailments being ignored by the Federal Communication Commission. And why have more than 220 of the world's leading scientists signed an appeal to the World Health Organization and the United Nations to protect public health from wireless radiation and nothing has been done? I've heard the term conspiracy theory so many times while sharing information about the potential harmful effects of 5G. No, nothing would make me happier than to find out that 5G is safe, that our health and safety can be assured, to see scientific research that proves we have nothing to worry about. But the bottom line is that the telecommunications companies cannot guarantee us our health and safety. If they could, they would. And we wouldn't be here today having this meeting. It's important to know that this isn't something that we need to be afraid of. This is something to take action against. This is an opportunity because we can change this. People who don't want to learn or know about this are giving away their power. By not speaking up, they're silently giving their consent. Not wanting to know won't stop the rollout of 5G and its potentially dangerous effects. The damage 5G radiation will do on a genetic level is irreversible. I know that I don't want to feel the responsibility of knowing this information and just sitting back and letting it happen. No way. Right now, we don't need 5G, so why not wait until research has been done, until the standards have been updated? To date, there has been no informed public consultation. There has been no risk assessment. However, there has been a scientific objection where over 200 experts, creditable people, called for a moratorium in 2017, citing human health effects and impacts to wildlife. The key points in their appeal were, Present levels of RF radiation are already toxic. Present levels of RF radiation are already toxic. Harm to humans and other biology is already proven. Harm is evidenced below the current safety limits and 5G will substantially increase exposures. Taking all of this into account, it is not unreasonable to ask for our health and safety to be assured before the rollout of 5G in our community. It is not unreasonable to ask for our beautiful environment and our beloved native species to be protected. Our petition is addressed to the Kuiper District Council. I have faith in our local council. They're the voice of our community, and right now, we need them to take our concerns to the next level. Our plea to the Kuiper District Council to act as a voice of our community is well justified. We need the development of more protective EMF guidelines, encouraging precautionary measures and educating the public about health risks, particularly risks to children and fetal development. Our community's health and safety, as well as our environments, should be a priority and of utmost importance. We are here today to learn because knowledge is power. We are here today to go from fear to aware and empowered. We are here because we have a choice and a decision to make. We can choose to join forces as a community and use our collective voice to be heard when we say, we do not consent to 5G in our technology. Thank you. Now we have a recorded speech from a New Zealand doctor, Dr. Robin Kelly, a London qualified medical doctor of 44 years standing and a general practitioner in Auckland for 38 years. He is also a medical and science researcher and writer. Two of his books have won Science Book of the Year prizes in the USA. 
He has spent the past two years researching the effects of various electromagnetic frequencies, including non-ionizing radio frequencies on human and animal tissue, with a focus on any potentially tissue damaging effects. Hello everybody and welcome. Uh, I'm Dr. Robin Kelly. I'm a family doctor. I have been researching this uh, subject now for uh, two years. Uh, I have a background in radiation oncology uh, in the UK and here in Auckland, but I've been in general practice for 38 years. Now a family doctor has to look at all the evidence in front of them and do what's safe. First do no harm. That's my job. Uh, one has to take each bit of science, we have to study it and be critical of it so that we, so people coming to see us, our patients, are not uh, are subjected to anything that's dangerous. And I've applied this principle rigidly, as rigidly as I can do, uh, for 38 years. It was the reason that I started to take up acupuncture, and I'm sure if I'm interviewed uh, by the media, that will be a big cross against my name, because I'm actually investigating the uh, science uh, behind other uh, health systems. Uh, that have been used for uh, many years in other countries. So my, my focus has been first do no harm, also known as the precautionary principle. Now I have to congratulate both Liz and Mangavai and thank you both for inviting me uh, in, to talk to you. I wish I could be there on my own, uh, in, in person, but I, I've been unable to do that. Uh, and congratulate Liz for her amazing, brave, uh, appearance on Seven Sharp, which has really backfired on TVNZ and shown TVNZ in their true colours. And I'll possibly mention that in a minute. So what's happening to, I, I'm going to be talking about the science and how I have, I have looked at this science and tried to make sense of it. And the bottom line is that there has been a paradigm shift. No longer can anybody say that Ionizing radiation, the stuff of x-rays and nuclear fallout, is the only problem. There's a whole spectrum of problems that go right through the electromagnetic spectrum into the radio frequencies that already surround us, but are going to be highly intensified with the proposed rollout of 5G. Now, uh, the National Toxicology Program in the US, in combined with the National Institutes of Health, which is a sort of massive organization, have shown a uh, statistically uh, significant uh, increase in brain and heart cancers in rats exposed to these radio frequencies over a period of time. But until recently, and possibly not so recently, uh, the mechanisms behind that haven't been elucidated and now that's completely changed so we've got a paradigm shift. We have many many studies uh, and showing that uh, it is that what happens to our cells exposed to what we have already uh, causes what we call oxidative stress which can lead to DNA damage uh, and can lead to uh, all sorts of chronic conditions. And we know that smoking does this and stress does this as well. So this is another major stressor to the body. We have known this since 2011. And of course, science progresses, progresses two steps forward and one step back. So in other words, you have to have repeated studies that show this. So we have repeated studies. We have had analysis of hundreds of studies that show this. And uh, the, in, in fact, one study that came out from... Uh, the Ukraine just uh, two years ago uh, showed that out of a hundred such studies, 93, 93% show oxidative stress within, within our cells. And that's just exposed to what we have already. And uh, in, in Australia as well, researchers have shown that uh, 216 out of 256 papers on this have shown this as well. So we're dealing with a paradigm shift, and this is why the scientists around the world that know about this are so up in arms about it. And we want to know why, why this is being ignored. So I have looked at the politics, I've looked at the 
uh, governing bodies uh, and committees around the world that seem to be ignoring this and feeding into the advisors to our government who just quote um, the committee findings. We find that <coughs> the committees, uh, there's no election into the committees, there. Uh, people are, are uh, proposed and invited in. There's a complete crossover between this major committee called ICNERP, the WHO, uh, and the industry. The WHO uh, are want to, in fact, encourage, and I can understand this, technology, especially wireless technology, so that the world and the third world gets access to this and there are some advantages on this. But this this drive has been abused and now they are actively ignoring the science. So that's where I come in, the science. And I'm writing to pretty well every minister and the CEO of Spark about the science uh, and I'm getting these standard, oh, we're just doing what we're told. So what do you amazing guys do? It's got to happen. It's got to happen from the people, from the con concerned parents, grandparents, because I tell you what, there's even more disturbing stuff coming through. And one of these, if you could just allow me to have a look at this, uh, there's a series of studies being done uh, how these wireless uh, radio frequency signal signals can trigger cell death and significant loss of follicles in the ovaries of offspring. So therefore, if you're carrying your baby, there's a number of studies that show that that baby, that female, will not develop, uh, will have the death of her follicles and therefore her fertility uh, uh, affected in years to come. Now, how can anybody, anybody with any sense, allow this to happen to future generations? <clears throat> so, to recap, we've got all the science behind us and behind you uh, to show that we have to be have be, have caution and show the precautionary principle. Do not be conned by uh, anybody who says that non-ionizing radiation isn't dangerous and that the only effects of non-ionizing radiation are the heat effects on the body. We have known this since, since 2011 in Russia and behind the old Iron Curtain before Glasnost. They've known about this for, it looks like, over, over 50 years. And just important thing about the media, the media are involved in this. The New York Times uh, have formed a, a bond with Verizon and their focus is to produce virtual news with no time lag at all in 3D and holographic form. So every news outlet out there is involved in selling the 5G. And this is terribly important. In fact, I've even thought about them being equivalent to um, the drug dealers <laughs> because they're the ones that are going to use this technology. And in my communication with these people, I've said, it's you guys that are going to be, uh, have the most danger. Those who are working in these 5G hubs are going to uh, suffer the most. So from an employer's point of view, you, this is very, very serious. And, and we all know that the insurance companies aren't going to be covering this. So all power to you, Mongwai. This is just you. It has to work from the people, from the sensible people. I don't believe the ministers um, are capable of making these decisions. They all hide behind uh, their advisors like, Let yes, minister, it has to come from the public. I want you to encourage your MPs uh, to raise this in the House, raise this with Jacinda Ardern. Did she really want her child <laughs> to be exposed to this? This is a government who have invested in well-being uh, as part of their budget. Now they have to put their money where their mouth is, okay? And you guys, you guys uh, are the people, uh, the public that can do this. I can do the science bit, I can do my doctory bit, but it's got to come from the sensible people like you. So all the best, have a great uh, meeting, um, and I hope to see you at some stage, bye. So grateful for Dr. Robin Kelly for doing this video for us.
Okay, our next speaker is Sue Gray, all the way from Nelson. Sue Gray is community and environmental rights lawyer and strategist based in Nelson, New Zealand. She specialises in strategy, advocacy, education and law reform for complex legal, medical, environmental issues. Sue has tertiary qualifications in law, science, uh, science, microbiology and biochemistry, and in environmental health and management, and has worked both in private practice and for central and local government, <coughs> including five years in health protection investigating infectious diseases and checking chemical storage and discharges into the Manukau Harbour and two years as a senior lawyer for DOC. She is nationally and internationally recognised for her work around New Zealand to promote safe, affordable access to cannabis for medicinal use, more responsible use of poisons and banning aerial use of 1080 and other cruel and discriminate poisons, and more mindful use of technology, including Wi-Fi in schools, cell phones, smart meters, and radio and cell towers. She is an advisor to Oceana Radiation Scientific Advisory Association and was recently appointed as a commissioner for the ITNJ inquiry into the weaponization of the biosphere. So is also an advisor to the New Zealand Outdoors Party, which is the only political party concerned about 5G. Welcome, Sue. Hi everybody and thank you so much for inviting me and for everybody coming on a Sunday afternoon because it's a big commitment to come along and, and listen to people talking about these things. But it is so, so important because the whole future of New Zealand is being driven by corporate interest and not by the public interest. And the public's lost their voice. We're being told we need all these technologies. We need to stop them and say, ask us first. Back with the genetic modification inquiry, I think it was about 15 years ago, the government actually did ask the public before they made a decision about that new technology. But something's changed since then, and now they're just rolling through the whole, all the changes and just telling us what we get. Well, what happened to democracy? We live here. We're the people who are affected. It's us, it's our children, it's our grandchildren, and we need to be asked. The science, the, the issues on the science are largely one. We know it harms us. There's no question. What we have to work, the, what we have to win is win back a forum to actually take back our rights as people. And it's so important. And what we can do, I've got all these notes, but I've got so much to say, so I'm just going to talk. <laughs> <laughs> what what we can do is come together exactly as you're doing here. There's a group in Nelson doing the same thing. There's groups in the Coromandel, there are groups in Tauranga, there are groups all around the country. We need to get angry and we need to make it the government's biggest problem so that they have to listen to us. We have to make the biggest fuss imaginable because if we don't, the corporates will just roll on through and nothing will change. But if we all speak up and find our voices and talk to each other, connect with different groups around New Zealand, connect with different groups that are concerned about the lack of democracy, it doesn't matter if they've got a different issue from us, because actually the whole issue is that the government's not representing the people. So somehow we have to, to work out all these new ways. We actually can use the technology that we're concerned about, but we need to use it to work for us instead of against us. So, so on the one hand, I'm here saying we do need the technology, but on the other hand, I'm saying let's use it mindfully and let's use it for our benefit, not to our detriment. The thing about 5G is it's harmful. We know that. We've been told we need it, but do you know what we need it for? We need it for driverless cars, really. We need it for the internet of things so that somebody can sit in a, in a computer in, in an office somewhere and turn on our washing machine at two o'clock in the morning when there's less load on the power system. Do we need it for actually humanity, for the real things that are important to us? No, we don't. We were told with 3G and 4G we needed it for our schools and we needed it for Wi-Fi. But in actual fact, all of the OECD research on that shows that some technology is good but more is not better. 
And a lot of the schools around the world are actually taking out all the smart learning and they're going back to the basics because they realise that actually people need to learn basic skills like connecting and planting flowers and patting dogs and going for walks in the park and all the sort of simple things. And the technology side of things are actually as a secondary thing. Yes, you might be interested in that and maybe you're more interested than others, but it's not essential for our health and well-being and particularly for our mental health. So I got involved in radio frequency radiation in Nelson when Telecom decided they wanted to put a cell tower about five metres from the sand pit at the Atfai Play Centre, which was where my old, two older children had been and my youngest daughter was just at a play centre across the road. And the community said, hey, this is not right. And we made a big fuss. And we stopped that cell tower. And I learnt a lot. I've, I've stayed interested in radiation issues ever since then um, and followed it through as, as different changes have happened. It's really concerning because it, it, our instinct is right that it's harmful. But we're told that it's a matter of science and you're a bit silly if you don't really understand the science and you haven't really got a view. Well, actually, they're wrong about that because it's about, first of all, it's a lot more than science. Science is necessary, but it's not sufficient. It comes down to values, ethics. What kind of world do we want to live in? Do we want to live in a world that's dominated by computers or technology, or do we want to live in a world where people come first and we respect nature and we work with nature? Because if we just sit back and let everything go the way it's going, it's driven by the corporates. It's not driven by us. And we just become pawns that are just sort of toys for them to play with. So, so science is necessary but not sufficient. It's, it's much more than science. But the other thing is with the science, they play games with us too. The other issue that I've done a lot of work on is medicinal cannabis and hemp. Now, hemp's been used for 4,000 years plus around the world as a herb, as a medicine, and yet we're told that in New Zealand we can't have people using medicinal cannabis until there's research to prove it's safe. <laughs> and yet, with radiation and with poison, we're told, well, let's assume it's safe until it's proven dangerous. Now that is just how crazy the assumptions are. They're not assumptions because they're good for the public. Those assumptions are made by the corporates who are making a whole lot of money about the way things are going and they're trying to exclude us from having a say. So who does make these decisions about what's safe and what's not? Well, as we've heard from Dr. Kelly, there's an organisation called ICNERP, which is an organisation based in Germany, where they handpick advisors from around the world, and the criteria is that the advisor will give advice that suits their agenda. Now, guess what? In New Zealand, we have an organisation called the Interagency Advisory Committee on the Health Effects of Non-Ionising Radiation, which advises the Minister of Health. Guess what the criteria is for membership of that committee? That it gives the Minister the advice that he wants to hear. So, the three top experts in New Zealand who understood the biological effects and the harmful effects of radiation were not allowed on that committee because their view was that it's harmful and the Minister of Health didn't want them. One was Dr Sophie Walker, who actually worked for ESIL, uh, ESR, one of the government organisations. She was told not to attend any more meetings because she was putting together regular reports saying that there were harmful biological effects from radiation, that's 3G and 4G. Um, Dr Mary Redmayne, who did a PhD in Wellington about harmful effects of radiation, she studied cell phone use and cordless phone use by intermediate school aged children in Wellington. And she established that those children had enough exposure by the time they were 16 to have a significant increased incidence of getting a brain tumour or risk of getting a brain tumour. I think it was something like 60% of children from their, from their cell phone use and cordless phone use. She wasn't allowed on the advisory committee either, even though she went on from her PhD in Wellington to go and work at Monash University and become a world expert. And the third advisor that wasn't allowed on the interagency committee was me, who's got a, a science degree, a law degree, and I worked for the government, but again, my advice was very inconvenient, so I wasn't allowed anywhere near it. That's how it works. The, um, 
The government in New Zealand used to follow the World Health Organisation advice on radio frequency radiation up until 2011. And back then the World Health Organisation said, yes, there might be a heating effect and we have to take care about that, but where there's no evidence or there's no conclusive evidence of biological effects, so we don't need to worry about that. In, in May 2011, the World Health Organisation, based on a big report from ECNERP um, and a lot of advisors from all different perspectives, decided that um, radio frequency radiation was a class 2b carcinogen. So that's a possible carcinogen. It's not a definite one, but based on all the research they did and this massive volume of materials and reports they put together, they decided it was a possible carcinogen. And they put out a publication all around the world that people and governments in some countries <coughs> took some um, awareness of that and, and were more cautious. But in New Zealand, whereas up until then they said, yes, we're heavily guided by the World Health Organization, from then on they said, oh, no, the World Health Organization, they, they've got it wrong, they can't prove it's a carcinogen, so let's just ignore that. So that's the kind of, um, they changed the rules to suit themselves, they keep changing the goalposts, you see it over and over and over again. Now, why don't our ministers listen to the people? Well, that's quite interesting too. I did a few Official Information Act requests to try and find out. So I wrote to the Minister of Health, the Minister for the Environment, and the Minister of Technology, and I asked them if they could please give to me copies of all of the information that they've got, first of all from their official advisors, and from the Interagency Advisory Committee, but also from other world experts and from anyone else in New Zealand, so I could see that they were getting some sort of balanced advice. I'm still waiting to hear back from Chris Barthoy, the Minister of Technology, but David Clark, the Minister of Health, and David Parker, the Minister for the Environment, have both written back and said, oh, we're advised by the Interagency Advisory Committee, this is this committee that we just talked about, that you can only get on and give them the advice that they like, and we've had no other advice at all. And I said, well, look, this is really, really strange, because I'm a member of the Oceania Advisory um, Group, and I know that a lot of these world experts have written to our ministers and they have given them advice, so what's happening? So I went back to David Parker and I said, well look, this can't be right because I know you've got this information. Oh no, 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 that's not advice, that's communications we get. So that goes in a completely different pile and they don't even read it. So this is the problem, there's all this information of harm but it's not getting through to our advisors because people are filtering the information and only letting through the information that they want them to have. So what can we do? And this is where I've touched on, we need to make a big fuss. Because if we don't make a big fuss, it'll just carry on exactly how it is. And it's not easy to make a big fuss because we used to have the resource management process but up in 2008, Nick Smith, who was the Minister for the Environment at that stage, passed exemption regulations or um, National Environment Standards for Telecommunications, which said as long as it meets this New Zealand standard from, two th uh, from 1999, let's assume it's safe. And so you cannot make any submission under the resource management process on the safety of radiation if it complies with the New Zealand standard. And the New Zealand standard, again, is a standard that was set by the, the engineers to basically allow anything that's not cooking you. So that was in 2008. In 2016, it's got even worse because they've updated these regulations. So not only can we not submit on the radiation and the harm and the safety issues, but now any extension to power poles and telephone poles to put a, a cell tower on top is deemed to be a permitted activity. So at least under the old regime, we could make a fuss about new poles and things going in. Now, there's no process at all under the local planning rules, the resource management rules, to, to challenge these processes. Now, it's clearly wrong. So we've really got a whole combination of things that we can do because we can't use the most obvious solutions that we normally have, but the type of things we can do, we can do legal challenges, but that's not always easy as well because unfortunately the courts can be influenced politically. We've just had a legal challenge on um, 1080 and arguing that there's a law that says no person shall deposit a substance on the bed of a river without a consent. The court decided that substance somehow means structure. Oh. 
No person shall deposit a structure on the bed of river. Well, actually, there was another section that dealt with structures. Um, if Parliament had have thought that they were talking about structures in the other section, thought they would have would have thought of that and, and said that. So it's 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 heavily politically influenced. We can go to the Parliament itself and argue that these regulations are unlawful, and that's one of the things I'm working on doing now to challenge the regulations, because how can you have regulations deeming something as safe when the World Health Organization has said that it's a potential carcinogen, and we've got, more, and that was already a few years ago, we've had more and more evidence coming through since then showing that the things that we feared um, of harm are now becoming more and more clearer that it is causing this type of harm. Um, so Parliament, the, well the regulations must be um, achieving the purpose of the Act, which is what they call sustainable management. So it's not clearly sustainable to be pretending that something's safe when we know it's not. So that's something we can do, and that's a sort of a semi-legal, semi-political challenge. But the other thing that we can do is people power. People standing together. Just look what's happened with this protest about the sale of land in Auckland. If enough people get together and they make a big enough fuss, long enough, the government back down. And there's a really, really good opportunity with this because next year's election year, and guess what? Election year is the one year that the government actually really does start to listen to the people. Um, so it's just a case of getting everybody as organised as possible, connecting with everybody you know. Go home and tell everybody you know about 5G. Tell them about the concerns. Tell them what's not right about it. Tell them what they can do. Get, get organised just to make a fuss as much as you can. If anyone that's concerned, tell them at schools, tell the teachers, tell your neighbours. If you're sitting on an aeroplane, tell the person next to you on the aeroplane. Get it into as many groups as you can and have wonderful people like Liz making meetings and making fusses and then maybe arrange a national day when everybody goes to Parliament and says, hey, well, we're not going home until you agree to listen to us. Get enough people there, they'll listen all right. But if we don't, they won't. Now, I'm a big believer in intuition that we actually know if something's not good for us. We know. But we've been told, you know, you're not a scientist, you don't really know what you're talking about. But we've got to actually learn to step up and listen to ourselves and take back our power on these things. Way back in the, whenever it was, the Roman Empire, they brought in their lead pipes and poisoned them. That was the end of the Roman Empire, the beginning of their end, because they brought in this wonderful new technology that they thought was a miracle cure for all sorts of things, and they poisoned themselves. And isn't it pretty darn sad that we're going through the whole same cycle again now? So look, there's a lot of other things I can talk about, but that's just sort of my thoughts on, on a range of what we need to do. I'm really, really happy to answer questions. I'm not sure. When Sue Kedgley was in the Green Party, she was amazing. When we were trying to stop the um, five or the cell tower at the Five Place Centre, um, she was really great. But that was back in 2008, and since then, um, Kevin Hay took over on the health policy, and now they don't. They seem to be pretty silent on the whole thing, unfortunately. So if you ask a question, if you just write to the minister, you usually get a letter back saying the minister's very busy and uh, they may or may not respond to you in due course. But if you ask a question under the Official Information Act, they're legally required to answer you within 20 working days, unless they've got a very good reason why not. In fact, they're legally required to answer you as soon as reasonably practicable and no longer than 20 working days. And it's, it's a strategy that's almost evolved a little bit accidentally, but it's been very effective. And it started out a few of us, but a lot of people are now asking questions. It's an easy thing to do. There's no particular format or anything. You can just write, I suggest, to the Minister of um, the Environment, so that's just david.parker at parliament.gov.nz, the Minister of Health, which is david.clark at parliament.gov.nz, and the Minister of Technology, which is chris.farfoy, I think it's F-A-A-F-A-I, <coughs> at parliament.nz. And you can just hit it up, Official Information Act question, 
and any questions you've got, you know, what safety information have you got about, TNA, uh, about 5G? Or um, what, what research are you relying on? Who are you getting advice from? Any questions you can think of. Because if people keep asking questions, first of all, they start to spot these trends and they go, gosh, gosh, why are we getting all these questions? Are, are the public concerned? Gee, elections are coming. We better start thinking about this. Plus, if you ask the questions, you might actually educate them and you might make their officials go out and get some information. Um, and and you, often they give you a bit of a hopeless answer the first time, but there's nothing wrong at all with going back and saying, well, you've said this, but actually, what do you mean by this? So you can keep this whole thing going and going and going and going. And what's actually happened with DOC now is we've actually bogged down the whole department. And we've become, it's almost like a sort of active resistance of the people that they won't meet with us. Well, they've started to meet with me now, but they, they didn't want to meet with us. But actually we've made them, we've forced them to engage with us through a legal process. It's free, anyone can do it. And it's a very, very effective way of getting information. Information is power. They're sitting on all our information because it is our information that they've got. Let's make them explain why they're doing what they're doing and where the information gaps are. Let's just keep teasing it out. They hate answering the questions and it gives us good information. So it's, that's something that's accidentally become a, a quite a, a very effective strategy. Um, so just a really good idea to do the same with 5G. And you know, I, I sometimes say, right, my mission is I'm going to ask one lot of questions every day. It takes me five minutes, it probably takes them five hours to answer it. And between us, I can then share the information around people and others can follow up on it. So just imagine if, if 100,000 New Zealanders started asking questions about 5G. Just imagine. And it's so easy. There's a website, fyi.org.nz. And I'm not sure who set it up, but it's a really good website for asking your official information at questions as well. And you just put in what department you want to ask, and it automatically puts in the email and everything for you. And then you just put in your questions, and then it automatically gets sent, and then you get notified when the questions are back. I, I, I think it's better that everybody does their own thing. They're all asking the same, different questions, because I think when government starts to feel that it's sort of a, a scheme and everybody's involved, then they start to discount it. Whereas if it's just coming from random all round, then they start to realise that there's something going on here. You can actually really bog down government. And what happens, the department has to respond. So they have to keep bringing new staff on. And when they have to go to the minister and say, Minister, we need another 10 staff because we're getting 100 OIAs every Monday morning. Everybody suddenly starting to say, what's going on here? It really is a very effective way. And I would say if anybody in this room did one OIA a month even, and you've got the people down at Raglan and the people elsewhere doing the same, government's going to, the department is going to stand up and say, hey, we've got a problem here. And we need a lot more funding for the Minister of Finance because we, you know, we, we, we're going to put 20 staff on there. So that's the strategy, I think, that would really work. And one. I think you should have one objective, which is to encourage the government to hold a Royal Commission over the next three years to review this whole subject. And until such time, there's a moratorium on any investment or any decision. You are only going to do this for a Royal Commission. Anything less than that, forget it. And I know that the government has our best interests at heart, but they don't know how to do it, correct? The role of government is very simple. They're there to safeguard the well-being of our citizens. And therefore, I'm delighted that this committee that does nothing at least reports to the health department. If they report into communications or business, it will be a different argument. I would also say, and I'm amazed today, that one word has never ever been mentioned today which is the most powerful lobby you've got to make change in New Zealand, which is to engage Māori. I'm being cynical. I think that back in 1843, 5G was actually discussed before the treaty was signed. But get Māori on board, and all of a sudden doors open in Wellington. I guarantee it. So my recommendations, by all means, involve our Member of Parliament, who nobody's seen since the election, 
don't waste your time at Carper Council because they report to the Minister of Local Government or just vanish. Seriously, no, no, nothing personal. I would talk to your friends around the country and get them to buy into your basic elevator pitch. We are fearful of the future. What we've got today will last us a few years. Take a step back, take a time back, do a Royal Commission and engage Māori. And you need one more thing, which is somebody inside the organisation. In my main charity, I was lucky enough to have the Governor General working with me. You need to find somebody like that in Wellington that believes in you and is prepared to put their reputation on the line. And I would suggest is somebody in the National Party, because they need somebody to hang their hat on before the election. <laughs> should be able to help you but the problem is because of the exemption regulations they the central government has taken the power away from yeah. local government so you can still get local government i would still go to local government but it wouldn't be my number one strategy because they're not the decision makers my strategy is go to the guy that can make the biggest difference and the biggest difference is central government. But local government should be your friend because they're here to represent you. So there's nothing to stop them from also going to central government. Another thing, elections coming. Yeah. Just imagine if a lot of people here signed up to join, to stand as candidates and put in their um, thing on their candidate information sheet, I'm standing because I don't want 5G and because I don't think local government's representing me. Now, just imagine how much power that would have all around the country, and if everyone that was concerned about it voted for those candidates. Mm. And suddenly you've got momentum and you've got numbers and you can actually do something. You'd still have to then get your council to put resources together to go to central government, but you'd at least have a funded entity to support you, as well as everybody doing it as volunteers in their own time. Yeah, and, and ask for meetings and ask yes. them to help you yes. and ask them to lobby central government, ask them to get the Minister of Communications down here, mm -hmm. um, or up here, I should say, um, to explain. You can do all sorts of things. You've just got to be really creative. You've just got to keep thinking of new ways to make an impact. And the timing. And timing. But timing is essential. Uh, local government's great now with the elections coming. So it's not officially recognised, but there's a huge amount of information and a lot of people get basically an allergic reaction to electromagnetic radiation, to radio frequency electromagnetic radiation. And it comes, it seems, from a cumulative effect. So we've all got a natural resilience to a certain degree where we don't really notice it. But if you get a tipping point for your body, you will start to get a range of allergic reactions. And once you get them, it's very hard to stop getting them. Your, your body is sort of hypersensitized. And smart meters are one of the um, trigger points for a lot of people, especially if it's near your bed. So if, first of all, try not to have a smart meter, but secondly, arrange your house so that you're not sleeping or working anywhere near it. If you have got one, try and get rid of it, but they're quite hard to get rid of. Um, and the other thing is turn off, turn off your um, Wi-Fi at night, Turn off your cell phone at night, turn your cell phone on to airplane mode whenever you possibly can so you've got minimum exposure because a lot of it is, it's partly how much exposure you get and it's how much rest your body gets from exposure to recuperate. So it's all sort of a cumulative type thing. You don't have to consent to them changing your meter to a smart meter. There's other meters that are not smart meters and you can just put a sign, I do not consent. You can notify your power company. You can notify the transmission lines company. I do not consent to a smart meter. When you've got bad reception, your phone works harder and yes. you get more radiation. Right. I mean, I'm, I'm one of these people that is becoming more and more electro hypersensitive, and for me to actually be in this room is actually quite painful. Mm -hmm. And so I'm having quite a hard time actually being here, but this is very important to me. Um, as I say, for seven eight years, I was um, recognised as one of the most specialist people in the area in New Zealand. I'm the electrobiology or consultant for building biology in New Zealand. I have like, one of the few people actually have a qualification in this area in the country. Mm -hmm. so, you know, in the mud brick room, 
Oh, yeah. Is that a window? You have no reception with your smartphone? So there is also some information about what materials depends on. Um, no, there's, there's two different ways. You can do an electronic petition. There's no sort of legal connection to that with Parliament, but if, if enough people sign it, they listen. You can also do a written petition to Parliament. I helped Rose Renton do her one on medicinal cannabis, seeking safe, affordable, accessible medicinal cannabis. She got, I think, 16, 17,000 <coughs> people that signed. Then it comes down to finding an MP that will take it to Parliament for you and again making a big fuss so that they know it's there because they actually have a discretion whether or not they will hold an inquiry. But if enough people sign and you make a big enough fuss, you will almost certainly get an inquiry. We, we got an inquiry back, I think it was 2008, with the um, FIP Centre. We got, um, I think it was only about... Remember now, maybe five, five or six thousand people signing, but it was a lot for the size of our community, and that, and because we got a couple of MPs, Sue Kedgley from the Greens back then, she was great, and a couple of the others engaged. We did get an inquiry, and she actually put some pretty good stuff on the record against it. The others, not so good, but at least it got something on there. But you know. But you word it up really carefully to say, I think that was great wording. We want to we the, let the people ask ask us first. We want a Royal Commission of Inquiry before any decision is made on 5G in New Zealand and before any spectrum rights are sold. And then get as many people as possible to sign it and get it into the system make it, and, and make it really public. Get it on the radio, get people talking about it, get all the schools and the parents to sign, get lots of numbers. That's how you stop it. Well, courts theoretically are a really good option. There are some practical challenges. Um, and there's, in, in overseas, um, you can sue for private personal injury. In New Zealand, because of the ACC scheme, we can't sue for personal injury, and so we tend to become a bit of a testing ground for a whole lot of new technologies and products from overseas <laughs> because they can test here and we can't do a thing about it. And we might have people dropping like flies from new medications or whatever else. I don't think it was the intended purpose of ACC, but it was a, certainly an unintended consequence of us having ACC, and I know for sure that they test things here. Um, so that takes away some of our rights to sue. The Resource Management Act um, is another potential problem, but people tend to um, use that as a be all and end all, but in actual fact there's a lot of other actions that you can use and that are available overseas and they are still available in New Zealand despite the Resource Management Act, so they're called torts of negligence and nuisance and trespass, that if somebody's doing something to you that's unreasonable, that's hurting you, you can go to court and ask for an injunction to stop it. Now you need to be pretty organised, you need to have some pretty good evidence together um, and you need to basically spend a bit of time pulling all that together but based on some of the world expert evidence around there's definitely a case to stop. I helped um, Penny Hargraves down in Christchurch with the Arua radio tower. There's a radio tower just on the northeast side of Christchurch and that's electromagnetic radiation as well. It's a very unfortunate one there because it's on the flat. There's several towers quite near each other so they have to keep turning up the, ta the power to out get their radio station louder than the other people's radio stations. And it's a mixture of AM and FM, so you get the sort of cumulative effects for all sorts of different things. They literally had people dropping dead, and they had animals dropping dead. They had no rodents and no insect problem because they all just went away from the, radi from the radiation. If you look on the um, Christchurch Replacement Plan website, there's a lot of evidence that Penny and some of her neighbours put in, um, must be probably about two or three years ago now, when Christchurch was urgently putting a new resource management plan in after the Christchurch earthquake. And if you look at the Christchurch replacement plan and look up Penny Hargraves, um, I, can't, I think it was chapter 14, but I'm not sure about that, about infrastructure. Um, she's put evidence in, and she was in contact with experts all around the world then. I'm, I'm still in contact with a lot of them. So we can call on all of that information, but what I'm saying is our courts tend to protect the status quo, and they tend to be quite politically driven. So you have to have, you, instead of having a 51%, 49% case, which is what you should have, you basically have to have a sort of a 99%, 1% case, so you really do have to be organised to use that. But it's a great idea, and it forces the issue at the very
very least, it forces the government to then put their cards on the table rather than just drifting along and doing what they want to do. They actually have to explain, so that in itself is a good thing to do. <laughs> and, and the radiation impairs mental health. There's no question. It makes people, um, it, not only people, but the animals. That was one of the things in Arua, that otherwise really gentle animals, the male animals became really aggressive. They'd take them away from those paddocks away and they'd go back to their normal personalities. Um, and it, it basically creates um, an ability to think and comprehend and listen and learn and all the kind of things that you need to do to be organised to take on the government. It takes away your ability to do those things. So again, another reason why you've got to act sooner rather than later before the radiation comes. They know all this because the um, Russians did it to the Americans in Moscow way, way, way back. And there was loads of research back in the 60s and 70s about the concerns and all the gaps in the research and all the safety tests that needed to be done. And then the whole thing flipped back the other way when the, when the business side got involved and then all of a sudden it was, well, if there's a gap, let's just assume it's safe. Whereas before that, they identified all the gaps of what research did need to be done, and the mental health effects was one of the major concerns. And I think the bees are telling the story too already, aren't they? Yeah, the bees, absolutely. Yeah. When the bees and all the insects go, you know you've got a real problem. But I think that um, young children are also a voice to be heard, and our friend here is talking about his after years of being exposed to the city or whatever it was, our adult children were born very depressed. And I'm sure one of the main difficulties and the things that are happening to our children are part of the problem is the electromagnetic fields which have gone crazy. And so for you to be struggling to be in this room, I, I totally understand that. Imagine what it's like for our children in a classroom when they've got industrial strength Wi Fi, zooming through the walls attacking their central nervous system, which isn't mature until at least 2021, uh, it's going to be horrendous for them. Can I just give you one example from my testing, my years of testing, that, was, that really talks to what this lady is saying? The, the one, house, <coughs> one house I tested, the, um, I was called in because the lady was concerned about 50,000 volt overhead power lines, and that wasn't really the issue, but um, as I carried on to test the house, she then opened up me a little bit and said, well, what I'm really concerned about is that my three-year-old, I've just been told that, that, uh, that this child should be tested for, tested for, um, is it? ADHD. Or, or, or just, it had to be tested because of behavioural issues. Yeah. And I had a three-year-old and a one-year-old. <coughs> Keep the story brief, in this three-year-old's bedroom, where the kid's head was, there was a runaway um, water head on the outside wall. <laughs> they put out really big magnetic fields. Um, maybe 10 to 20 times more than what I would accept as a sleeping area. So straight away the kid was in a big magnetic field. Um, the electric fields, because it's a two-story house, most two-story houses, the electric fields through the floors are very high, so this kid was sleeping at about 12 volts. Half a volt is what's more acceptable. Um, so very, very high electric fields. Um, there was a, a massive amount of dirty electricity at times, the metal would almost go off scale. <coughs> and the, because the, this kid would, these kids would wake up three, four, five, six times a night regularly, they never ever slept through the night once in their lives. They had bit, well, was video monitors on the children. Oh. And when I put my high pregnancy meter where the kid's head was, it went off scale. Oh. So the first thing I said to the, the mother was, please get rid of all the wireless video gear. Um, we're going to we'll turn off your Wi Fi basically all the time because they didn't need it. They could wire up their <coughs> so Wi Fi is on, wireless baby monitor is gone, and then um, I asked them to turn off all of the power circuits at the circuit board except for the refrigerator and the alarm system, which too was difficult to turn off for them. And, <coughs> and we also moved the bit away from these magnetic fields, but they, they diminished or were gone because the power was turned off. The, the, the dad who I've never met came out three days later. I'll never forget his words, it was amazing. He, he said to me, the first thing he said to me is, thank you so much, our children are angels. Oh, and what had happened was that their whole behavioural problems had completely gone. <laughs> and it was just this cumulative effect of all these individual electromagnetic radiation. Because we are electrical beings.
and the science can't measure it because when they do testing for science, they try and measure one thing. But what happens in real life, it's the combination of all the different things. So by the very way they design the test is almost destined to not show us anything. They're basically going every 100 or 200 metres. They're going everywhere because it's a very low, short length, high energy way, but doesn't go very far. So they have to just have so many of them. So whereas we've been objecting to cell towers being near homes and schools and hospitals and that type of thing, if they have 5G, they'll just be everywhere. It's the next logical extension of this, and it's, it's really the battle for the house with the utilities, is that the smart meters actually have the ability to have a minimum of two motors in them, and possibly three. And so what I fear, and I mean, I've worked with, with, with Captain Smith years ago on stop smart meters website and all the rest of it, but what I really fear is that the smart meter will become the access point to the house and will become the 5G motor. Thank you. I'd just like, um, maybe we could all just give a little applause for all our speakers here today. I'm so grateful. <laughs> Thank all of you for being here and really taking part and engaging. Um, this is obviously important to all of us and this is so important having this community meeting here today to really join forces. That's what this is for. This is an information meeting so we can really connect, we can learn more about what 5G is before we take the next step. This is a first step for us. So this isn't it, you know. Um, and so thank you. Thank you for being here. And please stay in touch with us via our Facebook website if you're on Facebook.